In this video, we're going to talk about animal behavior, and some types of animal behaviors are shown here on this picture. So first off, those little ducklings following their mother. That's an example of imprinting, where young, after they're hatched, they have a critical period where they'll bond to and follow the first thing they see. Hopefully, it's their mother. Um, uh, agnostic behavior, this is often seen in terms of uh, males competing for dominance or uh, social hierarchies that, that occur within uh, large populations, large social populations. And establishing these hierarchies are important because it helps to actually reduce stress and reduce fighting once they have established that, that social hierarchy. Uh, this raven uh, trying to figure out how to get that meat is a good example of cognition or insight. So we'll talk about how that's a good example of actually being able, uh, it, or animals of high intelligence can actually solve a problem without having seen it done before or imitate something else. Um, these insects are learning spatially to cue into to objects in and around them to, to find food or their nest or something like that. Uh, this blue jan down here, unfortunately, is, is learning associative learning, um, a foul taste with a certain coloration in insect, for example, like the monarch butterfly, or a posmatic coloration where you associate bright colors, distinct patterns with nasty, vile tastes. And down here, we have social learning, where, or sometimes called observational learning. So uh, the young see their parents doing something, model behavior, and then they learn how to do it. So see it done, and then do that um, social learning. OK. Uh, the most simple type of um, animal behavior, though, getting down to like insects and bugs, is can be seen if you pull up a log or a stone in your backyard. and. Uh, one motion you might see, or behavior you'll see, is kinesis. This comes from kinetic energy, just movement. And so, for example, uh, you pull up that that log, all those sow bugs start to move around, and they don't like the bright light, they don't like the sun, so they're going to they're gonna be more active. And once they get into an area where they're more comfortable, they're going to slow down, dark, moist, um, cooler, they're going to be happier and, and slow down. So the change in movement is an example of a behavior, and we call that kinesis. Um, taxis, that's more directional, like you take a taxi to go from one place to another. So taxis is directional movement. So examples of that are phototaxis, photo meaning light, so moths or insects moving towards light. You see that a lot with the termites during swarming season when they're all coming in towards the lights in front of your house, very scary. Um, or chemotaxis is moving towards or away from certain chemicals or smells. So um, I had an English teacher in high school. She wore this really fruity, sweet perfume and it attracted all the fruit flies that they were breeding down in the science wing of the building to her. And she was obviously that fruity smell was attracting them. They thought she was a big sweet fruit or flower. Um, so chemotaxis. Um, pheromones are also chemical signals produced oftentimes to attract members of the opposite sex, especially if an animal's in heat or in their breeding season, um, producing pheromones to attract for mating. Uh, geotaxis, this is an example of uh, the magnetic, Earth's magnetic fields that actually can cause an attraction or directional movement. So birds, actually, they've realized in migrating, animals sometimes cue into the Earth's magnetic field to migrate and to know when to head north or to head south. So a good example of geotaxis. And again, behaviors, is it in the genes? Is it environmental? Are all behaviors learned? Or are they all sort of pre-programmed? And the answer is, well, it's both instinctive and behavioral and learned. Um, so it's nature and nurture. Um, one that is primarily nature and in your genes are behaviors that we call instincts. So instincts are pre-programmed. Organisms generally will do them automatically. Um, so in an, a, a, in an innate inherited uh, dis, uh, behavior. So babies actually know to fear heights. They will move away from ledges. They also have an automatic sucking reflex. If you stick any your finger or anything in front of a newborn, they'll automatically grab it with their mouth and try to suck on it. Those are instinctive behaviors that have guaranteed their survival um, and have been reinforced. Fixed action pattern. This is a type of instinctive behavior, but it's usually a series of actions. So if there's usually some kind of stimulus and it causes this 
somewhat more elaborate response. Uh, a good example of a fixed action pattern is in the stickleback fish. So male sticklebacks will respond to the stimulus of a red belly. Anything with red on the bottom side, they will attack. So when they experimented with sticklebacks, they took something that looked a lot like a male stickleback but didn't have a red belly there on the top. That was not attacked. Then they took a bunch of objects that did not look at all like male sticklebacks but had red bellies and they were attacked. So the red belly in this case, or the red underside, was what we call a sign stimulus. And when the male sticklebox saw anything with a red belly, it attacked it. And it went through this whole, it didn't stop. Once it saw that red belly, it went in and assumed it was another male and tried to really, really attack it. Observational learning, this is that idea of seeing by doing, monkey see, monkey do, you could say. So. Um, Obviously, young sometimes see their parents doing something and then learn to imitate their parents' behavior through observational learning. Uh, insight or reasoning, this is when you actually learn things without having ever seen them, and you actually come up with the behavior yourself. So the famous example of the ravens, where they placed meat on a string below them where they couldn't reach down with their beak and get it. They had to figure out, they actually had to reason if they pulled on the string and then held the string with their claw, they could then pull the string up a little bit at a time using their beak and claw. But this is an example of insight. They had to figure that out. They didn't see it done. They figured it out themselves. Habituation, so background noises in the room, the, the air conditioned blower that you hear in the science lab all the time, you tune that out. You, you learn to tune out certain stimuli. Okay, um, if a animal hears a warning signal or a cry or a something that sounds threatening but they hear it over and over and over again they'll learn to turn out tune out those those stimuli so that's called habituation our ability to sort of figure out and turn off things that we might think are initially important but over time will become desensitized to um, imprinting again this was um, sort of first kind of publicized by uh, Conrad Lorenz, where he was working with geese, and he found that young geese would obviously follow their mother if they saw their mother, but young geese that were raised by humans would follow the humans. They would bond to him. During that critical period of their development, they would bond to the first individual they saw. They will also, songbirds will obviously imprint on the first song they hear. Hopefully it's their parents singing to them, but if they happen to hear other species sing, they'll actually learn the wrong song and then as adults go and mate with the wrong species. So it's interesting that that imprinting can happen with song or with bonding with the mother. But they learn, birds oftentimes learn these during this critical period early in their development. And once it's learned, it's in there, it's hardwired into their, into their behavior. Associative learning, this is when you associate one stimulus with another. Um, the best example of this is called classical conditioning, and a guy named um, <clears throat> Ivan Pavlov discovered this with dogs, right? So he fed the dog a little bit of meat while he rang a bell, feed a meat, ring a bell, feed a meat, ring a bell. After a while, ring the bell, the dog starts to salivate. The dog associates the ringing bell with the food, and this happens a lot probably with your pets. If they you know, see you come in with a bag of dog food or see you carrying something that looks delicious, they will start to salivate. They will start to anticipate food. They learn to recognize you know, my cat, the, the can opener. They just associate with the sound of their food getting opened, and they would get so excited about that, even if I was opening something that wasn't cat food. So this idea of associating one stimulus with another, because the two are often together, is is pretty well known now, and we call it classical conditioning. And that was uh, Pavlov's famous experiment. Here's a little joke about Pavlov. Operant conditioning, this is learning by doing, uh, or we, we might call trial and error learning. So um, this coyote attacked a porcupine once, and it probably learned after that one time never to attack something with spines on its back, right? My dog attacked a skunk once, learned never again attack a small thing with black with white stripes on it, especially when it lifts its tail up and shakes it at you. So uh, trial and error, learning the hard way sometimes, but um, learning by doing uh, is called operant conditioning. 
and agonistic behavior. This again is this sort of establishing dominance hierarchies and social order within groups. Uh, when these animals are fighting, they're usually not going to hurt each other seriously. As soon as one of them gets the advantage, the other will usually submit. And so these help establish social order and are not usually like the dominant male killing the weaker male. It's just to sort of establish the social order and reduce fighting in the future. So it's a, a way to sort of keep groups kind of in their social, proper social order. Altruism is sort of the opposite of that. That's when one individual does something that may be damaging to it or decrease its survival, but allows for greater survival of the group. So within prairie dog groups, uh, oftentimes, and many times it's the males that do this, if they see a predator or a bird or snake, something that's going to threaten the group, they'll call out, they'll screech out. And what they'll do is oftentimes attract that predator towards them, but by offering that warning, all the other prairie dogs will run for cover. So they will increase the chances that the other group members survive at their own peril or at their own risk. Uh, but this is an example of inclusive fitness. So it's not necessarily going to make that individual fit, right, evolutionary. That, that individual might die, have a greater chance of dying and not passing on its genes. But it's going to increase the chance that its relatives, its closest relatives will survive and pass on their genes. So by its altruistic behavior, it's actually increasing its fitness, its chance of its, its sort of genes within its larger family surviving and getting passed on. And another term for that is kin selection, that it's doing things to benefit its kin and not just itself. But these altruistic behaviors are interesting and oftentimes seen in mammals <clears throat> and allowing, again, benefiting the group. So that's a quick overview of some of the behaviors we see in animals, and we'll look at some examples in class tomorrow.